Hello everyone and welcome to another morning of learning with Breakfast by the Bay. My name is Letty and filming me today we have the very talented cameraman, Captain Chris. Uh, so I'm coming at you live today from the Exploration Center and Aquarium down here in Newport, Rhode Island. And I'm going to be talking to you about a very exciting animal today. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to wait for a couple people to join us and tune in. Um, while we're doing that, I want to thank everyone who's been tuning in every single day to learn about everything Save the Bay has to offer. We hope that it's really helped with your educational experience while you're at home. Uh, so, uh, today we're going to be talking about a really cool animal called horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are one of my favorite animals in Narragansett Bay, and they're a really unique creature. Uh, so, these unique creatures um, are the topic of the entire day today, but before we actually meet a horseshoe crab, I want to tell you a little bit about why they're so unique. So, you can just follow me right over here. Uh, so, for anyone who has just joined, my name is Letty, we have Captain Chris behind the camera, and we are talking about horseshoe crabs today and why they are so unique. And the reason that they're so unique is because they're actually the ultimate survivor. Ooh. Ultimate survivor, what does that mean? Uh, well, horseshoe crabs have been around in some form for about 400 million years. That means that there were animals that kind of looked like horseshoe crabs 400 million years ago, and then 265 million years ago, that's when we first started seeing horseshoe crabs as we know them today. Now, 265 million years is a very long time. That is a huge amount of time in the scale of the Earth, and a lot of stuff has happened in that amount of time. Uh, so horseshoe crabs have actually survived many things that have happened on the Earth since then. The first one is multiple major ice ages. Uh, so that means that throughout the millions of years on Earth, horseshoe crabs have survived fluctuations in temperature on the Earth. And that means that the ocean temperature gets higher, it gets lower, and while a lot of animals need a specific temperature in order to survive, horseshoe crabs have figured out a way to make it through all of that. Another thing that they've survived is something called the Permian Mass Extinction. So this was 225 million years ago. Uh, and the Permian Mass Extinction was a period on uh, a time on Earth when uh, the waters warmed up to really high temperatures. Um, a lot of other things were happening on Earth, but at that time, the water warmed up so much that 95% of marine life actually died during that time. So that means only 5% of animals survived and horseshoe crabs were one of them. That's crazy. Uh, next, they were around for the formation and the subsequent breaking up of the supercontinent Pangaea. So if you know anything about geology, you might know that at one point, all of the continents on Earth were grouped into just one supercontinent. And then eventually, they all broke apart and went to where we know them today. Uh, so that drastically changes the way that the ocean floor looks, it changes um, how those continents are actually getting keys and everything. So horseshoe crabs were able to survive that major change. And then finally, 66 million years ago, this would be the uh, mass extinction you're most familiar with, the asteroid, an asteroid hit the Earth and wiped out all the dinosaurs and 75% of all life on Earth. 75%. So first, horseshoe crabs survived that uh, Permian mass extinction where there were only 5% of animals to survive. And then 66 million years ago, they were able to survive and were only 25% of those animals that made it through. So really what I'm trying to say is horseshoe crabs have seen some stuff. Uh, so um, because all this happened, so one thing you want to remember is that horseshoe crabs not every single one of the horseshoe crabs survived this. A few members of their species were able to survive, and that left enough horseshoe crabs where they were able to continue their lineage to the horseshoe crabs that we know today. But because they survived all this, they are a super unique creature. We actually call them a living fossil because there's nothing else on Earth that looks like them right now. 
So, if you want to follow me right over here, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And uh, for anyone who is just joining us, once again, my name is Letty. This is Breakfast by the Bay, and today we're talking about horseshoe crabs. So I just talked about horseshoe crabs and uh, why they're ultimate survivors. You know, they've been around for a very long time. And because they've been around for so long, there's really nothing else that looks like them anymore. Uh, so what I have right here is a horseshoe crab classification. Scientists love to group animals into different categories. We talked about this a little bit in our other videos, uh, talking about how mollusks are grouped, talking about squids, all that good stuff. And so today, I want to tell you a little bit about horseshoe crabs and how they're grouped. Uh, so, uh, when a scientists are breaking down animals, they have a general system that they use. They use kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species to break them down into smaller and smaller categories. Uh, I like to remember this with a little mnemonic device. King Philip came over for good soup. I doubt King Philip would come over for mediocre soup, but right. King Philip came over for good soup. It's a simple way to remember how to break down animals. Uh, so, if we start off, we see that the major, the biggest group, you know, uh, is the kingdom Animalia. That means that horseshoe crabs are animals, which is something that we could have known already. Uh, then, we go down one lower level where we break things down, and we have Arthropoda. So this is the biggest group of animals on Earth, and includes insects and crabs. So we have a lot of things right there, so we want to break it down one more. And this is where we have this weird kind of classification called a subphylum. A subphylum is just a little bit lower than a phylum, but still above class. And this is called Chelicerata. Now this is a very important category when we're talking about horseshoe crabs, because this is a group that includes spiders, it includes ticks, scorpions, mites, and horseshoe crabs. Now, we said before that this group includes insects and crustaceans, but horseshoe crabs are not part of the crustacean or crab, uh, crab phylum. They are part of the group that includes spiders, ticks, and scorpions. So horseshoe crabs is actually kind of a misnomer because they're not true crabs. Scientists have discovered over the years through genetic testing that horseshoe crabs are actually more like spiders, ticks, and scorpions. And when I start talking about the anatomy of a horseshoe crab, that might start to make a little bit more sense. So if we go a little bit further down, we have a class called Marostomata. So Marostomata literally translates to mouth surrounded by legs, uh, which is kind of silly. And horseshoe crabs, uh, if, once we get to their anatomy, you'll actually see that they have a mouth that is surrounded by legs. Uh, and the thing about this is horseshoe crabs are the only living member of this class. When I was talking about those mass extinctions before, there used to be other animals that were related to horseshoe crabs um, that were grouped into this category. But, because of all those mass extinctions, those relatives didn't survive. So horseshoe crabs are the only living member of this class. Then we go down one more, and we have Xyphosura. Xyphosura, and that means sword-tailed animals. And horseshoe crabs do in fact have a tail that looks like a sword. Uh, we'll keep going down, just skip down to genus and species. We have Limulus. Polyphemus. And I really wanted to tell you guys about this because uh, the exact uh, translation of Limulus Polyphemus means a somewhat odd one eyed Greek ocean giant. <laughs> uh, so Limulus just literally means somewhat odd, which can definitely be applied to horseshoe crabs. As I've mentioned before, they're the only animal on the planet that's like this. And then Polyphemus was actually the son of Poseidon in Greek mythology, and he was a one-eyed giant that lived in the ocean. Uh, now this is kind of funny to me, because as we'll learn soon, horseshoe crabs don't actually have one eye, they have many eyes. Uh, so, instead of just talking about how they're broken down, why don't we actually learn about the anatomy of a horseshoe crab? That sounds Great. awesome, Letty. Perfect. I'll follow you. Follow me. All right. All right, so um, now 
now that we're here, I have a model of a horseshoe crab to show you. I promise that by the end of the video, we're actually going to be able to meet a live horseshoe crab. But the thing about horseshoe crabs is that, one, they can live in the water. So I don't want to hold a horseshoe crab up for too long while talking about its anatomy. Uh, and also, they're a little bit squirmy. So when I'm trying to show you some specific parts of the horseshoe crab, I want you to get a good, hard look at it. Uh, so, for anyone who is at home, this is a really good time to take out a piece of paper and a pencil if you want to follow along. I've drawn a horseshoe crab right up here for you. I have the top of the horseshoe crab and the bottom of the horseshoe crab so that you can draw a horseshoe crab, learn all about the anatomy, and label the picture yourself. Uh, so let's get started. Right here, we have my model of a horseshoe crab. Uh, now this is a really big model, and you actually can find horseshoe crabs that are this size sometimes. Um, if you do find a horseshoe crab that's this big, there's a very good chance that you are looking at a female horseshoe crab. Uh, male horseshoe crabs can get kind of big, but they would never get this big. It's female horseshoe crabs that would grow to this size. Very cool. Uh, so, if you start looking at this horseshoe crab model, um, we have two distinct body parts right here. And that's actually what groups them into that category with spiders and ticks and scorpions. They have two distinct body segments, as scientists call them. Uh, so this first part is this big round part that protects all of their vital body parts at the bottom. Um, and it's kind of just like the head that we have. Um, but when you need to protect yourself through something that you wear on your head that might help protect your skull and all that important stuff. And that's a helmet. So the first thing we're gonna label on our horseshoe crab today is that top round part, and that's called the helmet. So if anyone's following along at home, we have that right here. Perfect. Ms. Letty, while you're uh writing helmet up there, there was a question or two, kind of similar from uh, Megan and Marissa are, are at home. Uh, you had mentioned you didn't want to hold the horseshoe crabs out of the water the whole time. Yeah. Uh, Marissa was wondering if they ever come out of the water on their own. Yeah. Uh, and Megan was also wondering, you know, if they are out of the water, kind of how long do you think they could stay out of the water? Yeah, definitely. So um, a lot of animals that live in the ocean, not all, but a lot of them, like crabs, uh, do have adaptations that help them come out of the water for brief periods of time. So horseshoe crabs can in fact come out of the water and they come out of the water on their own. So horseshoe crabs, when they're breeding, which is normally during the May or June time, they'll come out of the water onto the beach to lay their eggs. Uh, they lay their eggs right there on the beach and then they'll go back into the water. And this could be hours at a time. So horseshoe crabs can in fact come out of the water, uh, lay their eggs, and then go back in. But we have to remember that's a survival mechanism for them. They need to reproduce in order to keep their species alive. So uh, while they do that voluntarily, I'm not going to take them out for too long. Great. That's a really good question. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, so we are looking at the helmet right here. And then we have this next part. This is the middle part of the body. Uh, and you know what? A horseshoe crab, when we're talking about the middle part, it's actually the same name as the middle part of our body. And that is called the abdomen. So you know, you might hear about someone having like six pack abs, something like that. Uh, horseshoe crabs also have that abdomen area. So we have our helmet and then we have our abdomen. Now, you might notice on the horseshoe crab that they have some spikes on the side of their body. I drew some in the picture, and there's also some on our model right here. And that's exactly what you would think it was for. It's for protection on the horseshoe crab. Then, finally, we have our tail right here. It's also called a telson, if you want to get a little scientific with it. Uh, now, our horseshoe crab model is a little bit broken at the end here, but normally a horseshoe crab would have a very pointy tail. I actually have the molt of a horseshoe crab right here. Oh, yeah. So, a horseshoe crab has a very pointy tail. Now, the question that I get the most about horseshoe crabs is if they use that tail to protect themselves. And the thing is, they don't use it to protect themselves at all. It serves two major purposes for them. One, it kind of helps them go through the water while they're swimming. So they'll move that around, kind of like a runner, to keep them going. And then secondly, 
If a horseshoe crab ever gets stuck on its back like this, it needs that tail in order to move back and forth just like that to eventually flip itself over. So it would be pretty silly if a horseshoe crab ended up on its back and it didn't have that tail to help pivot itself back up. So it would be pretty silly and horseshoe crabs probably would not have lasted as long as they have if all of them just got stuck upside down and then that was it. So that's good. Uh, so that's the third part on our drawing. We have our horseshoe crab tail, not used for defense, only to help move them around. Yeah, I, I know when we're in the aquarium or out in classrooms a lot of time, kids are really scared of that tail. They hear lots of bad stuff about it. It's true. Um, they heard a lot of bad stuff. And also, a lot of people see a horseshoe crab and they think it looks a lot like a stingray. You know, it has this round body and it has this tail that's really pointy. And the thing we know about stingrays is that they use that tail to protect themselves. So it's a natural inclination to think that a horseshoe crab would use this tail as defense but horseshoe crabs are not related to stingrays at all. They're part of a very different family. And so um, if you ever touch a stingray, you can tell immediately that they have a soft, squishy body. A horseshoe crab is hard and solid, and it is very similar to the exoskeleton you would see on a crab. So it's very cool. Uh, then finally, we have a very important part of the horseshoe crab. As I mentioned before, the scientific name for a horseshoe crab is Limulus polyphemus, and that means that unique one-eyed giant. Uh, I mentioned before that this is kind of a funny name for a horseshoe crab because horseshoe crabs have more than one eye. In fact, they actually have nine eyes. Nine eyes on a horseshoe crab. So um, they have two main eyes that I'm mostly going to be talking about today. Um, but those other nine eyes serve very important purposes too. So a horseshoe crab eye is right here and right here. Okay, And those eyes uh, help a horseshoe crab navigate around and they're very important for finding other horseshoe crabs. They want to find other horseshoe crabs so that they can mate and keep their species going. That's kind of what a horseshoe crab does for a lot of its life. <laughs> so. Um, those are the two eyes that we have on our model. But if you look at my picture right here, in purple is where I've drawn all of the other eyes. So we have these two right here, we have another two right beneath it, and then three right up here. And a lot of those are just light detecting eyes. Then on this tail right here, I've drawn a few eyes because those are light receptors that a horseshoe crab has on its tail. Uh, if you remember our video with Adam from the aquarium, he was talking about how sea stars have light receptors. So that just means that they can see darkness and lightness with that part of their tail, which is very interesting. So we have our four main parts of the top of the horseshoe crab. We have our eyes, we have our helmet, we have our abdomen, and we have our tail. Now, for anyone who's counting at home, you might have realized that I didn't actually say nine eyes or didn't actually show you nine eyes. And that's because a horseshoe crab does actually have two more eyes on its bottom. So now I actually want to flip our horseshoe crab model over and start talking about the bottom of a horseshoe crab, because that's where all the good stuff is. As you're flipping that over, I've got one more question for you, Letty. Um, Mike was wondering if the horseshoe crabs that he sees on the beach are dead, or if they're just like parts that are left behind. That's and how can he, question. could he tell the difference? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, so, the horseshoe crab pieces that you might see on the beach, they could be dead horseshoe crabs, but more likely than not, they're actually the molts of a horseshoe crab. So in our breakfast by the bay, we've been talking a lot about crabs, crustaceans, all that good stuff, and we did talk about how they molt. Now most things in arthropoda do molt, so horseshoe crabs do the same thing. If we look right over here, we have some molts of horseshoe crabs. So we have a helmet that we found, we have the abdomen, we have the tail, and these are just pieces that are left behind when the horseshoe crab literally just crawls right out of them and leaves that behind. It's kind of like when you find a snake skin, it's just leftover parts from the animal. 
Uh, now, honestly, the only way I know to tell the difference between the dead horseshoe crab and horseshoe crab molt is I normally just smell it to figure out the difference. And if it smells like low tide, if it smells like a dead animal, I'm just gonna leave that behind. But if you do find a horseshoe crab molt on the beach, you know, I like to take them home. They're pretty good decoration. I know a lot of people use them for artwork, things like that too. So that's a really good question, Mike. Thank you. So uh, if we want it, we're going to go ahead and flip over our horseshoe crab to look at the bottom. Now, a lot of the times, if I bring a horseshoe crab into a classroom, uh, I show the kids the top of this and they're like, ooh, interesting, and then we flip it to the bottom and all of a sudden it's like a horror movie, you know, you can't believe what you're seeing. But um, there's a lot of really cool things down here to point out. Uh, so, first off, I want to start with these two little claws right here. It might be a little hard to see. When we look at a real horseshoe crab, you're going to feel going to get a look, good luck. And these are called the front claws of a horseshoe crab. Uh, it's important to note that they're right by this hole right here, which is a horseshoe crab's mouth. So these two are their primarily, primary way of eating. These two features are their primary way of eating. So you look right here, you have the front claws, and those, when a horseshoe crab is crawling along the bottom of Narragansett Bay, they're picking up little food scraps that they might find. So these could be clam worms, it could be like dead stuff at the bottom of the bay, and they're going around and eating all that stuff, picking it up and putting it into the mouth right here. So once it gets to their mouth, they actually have little bristles all over surrounding their mouth that are kind of like the bristles on your toothbrush. Those bristles help slowly push that food into the horseshoe crab's mouth. Uh, so, very interesting way of eating. They're just spending their whole life on the bottom of Narragansett Bay, crawling around, using those front claws to put food into the mouth right there. I kind of like to call them the vacuum cleaners of the sea. They're cleaning up the bottom of the bay. Uh, because even that dead stuff that uh, sinks down to the bottom of Narragansett Bay, it's important for some kind of animal to clean that up, right? So, uh, if we look at our drawing, for anyone who's drawing along with us at home, we're going to have our front claws right here, and then we also have our mouth right there. Perfect. Alright, so next, we have all of these things right on the side. And anyone who's watching at home might be able to guess what those are called. These are the legs of the horseshoe crab. So you can see that they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten legs. Ten legs, wow, yeah. So these uh, animals are, it needs that many legs because they're crawling around at the bottom of the bay and they need to use all those legs to scoop themselves along as they're going. You might notice that these bottom legs look a little bit different from the rest. And these are kind of a feathered looking object. And this is so that when they go to the bottom of the bay and they want to hide, they'll bury themselves into the sand with those legs. The other eight legs are helping them move around. Uh, so, if you actually look at the legs too, it's an important feature. Uh, these ones are feathered, and these ones look like they have little peace signs at the end of the leg. So, um, this helps them also grab food whenever they're walking around. Very nice. Perfect. Uh, so, those are our legs. And then finally, we have this right here. So, this was all part of the helmet section, but then attached to their abdomen, right underneath, is a very important thing that helps them survive underwater. I'm wondering if uh, anyone at home can guess what that thing is that I haven't even mentioned. How do animals underwater breathe and survive? Mm. And I'm sure some of you got it. Those are gills. Now, these gills don't look like gills that most animals underwater have. They're a very unique kind of gill called book gills. And this is important when we're talking about a horseshoe crab and that lineage or those classifications because these book gills look a lot like book lungs that spiders and ticks and scorpions have. It kind of looks like the pages of a book. So that's how a horseshoe crab is able to breathe. Water goes over those gills and they take in all of that oxygen from the water. 
awesome. We finished labeling our picture now. We had our 10 legs right over here. Legs. And then finally, our book gills. Yeah, we did have a correct guess from Rob on the gills. He got that. Rob also had another question uh, before we transition out of here. Rob was wondering if um, horseshoe crabs are only in Narragansett Bay or if they're in any other places around the world. That's a really great question. So, right now, we are talking about an Atlantic horseshoe crab. So, an Atlantic horseshoe crab, you might be able to guess, is in the Atlantic Ocean. This goes all the way up from Canada down to the North Carolina, uh, from Canada to the North Carolina area. Uh, so, uh, you can find them all over that place. They love Narragansett Bay because it's a great place for them to find shallow water, find a lot of food, and they can go up on those sandy beaches to lay their eggs. But there are other types of horseshoe crabs in the world, uh, but they all live in the Indo-Pacific area. Um, so there's three other types of horseshoe crabs, and they're all out in the Pacific Ocean. So that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, so we talked a lot about our horseshoe crab anatomy. We're pretty much experts now in how horseshoe crabs look and how, uh, what their different features are called. Um, but the final thing I really want to show you is a live horseshoe crab. This is what we've been building up to the entire time. So let's move right over here. All right. Uh, so, the first thing I want to show you before we get to those live horseshoe crabs that we're going to get up and close and personal with is this brand new tank that we just got at the Exploration Center and Aquarium down here in Newport. Uh, so in this tank, we have a lot of animals living in harmony. We have some skates, we have some chain cat sharks, uh, and we have horseshoe crabs living in here. Yeah, I see one crawling up against the back wall over there next to that skate swimming around. That's really, yeah, so we have one back there. And looking at this tank, you might not think we have too many horseshoe crabs in here, but something you want to remember is that horseshoe crabs are the ultimate camouflagers. So that means that they already look like rocks so that they can blend in with the bottom of the sea floor. But then also, I talked about those back legs that they have that kind of look like feathers, and that helps them dig into the sand. So if we get really close right here, yeah, there's two in this picture right now. Yep, we can see some horseshoe crabs that have buried themselves One. under the sand. And they bury themselves right underneath these mussels and right over there. And these horseshoe crabs are doing that to hide from predators. It's the easiest defense mechanism. They don't have to use energy running away from anything. They can just hide in plain sight, which is really awesome. So, this is a brand new exhibit that we have at Save the Bates Aquarium. Uh, so you guys are all getting a pretty nice sneak peek at this. And once we reopen, you can actually come to the aquarium, touch a horseshoe crab, and hold a horseshoe crab, which is a really unique experience. You can learn the proper way to hold these animals so that if you find one in the wild, you can do the same thing. So now, uh, we're going to go right over here and talk about the live horseshoe crabs that we have. So Captain Chris is going to get a nice up close and personal look at this. You might be seeing these bubbles right now and this is just an aerator that adds oxygen to the water so that the horseshoe crabs can breathe. Because the longer they're in there, the more oxygen they're taking from the water. So I'm going to take out these horseshoe crabs kind of point out that anatomy again that we talked about before. And then I'm going to show you how to tell the difference between a male horseshoe crab and a female horseshoe crab, because they make it pretty easy for us. So first off, if we look here, actually, if we look here, we have our horseshoe crab. You can see it's a little squirmy, as I told you before. So this horseshoe crab has its helmet, it has its abdomen, and it has its tail. It has those spikes on the side that helps protect it from predators. Then, if we flip it over, we can see that mouth right there. And it's pretty obvious with this horseshoe crab that it has those bristles like a toothbrush that helps shove food in its mouth. We have its front claws right there, and we have all of its legs. But, if you were paying attention to the model, you might notice that there's something different about this horseshoe crab from what I showed you before. We have the feathered legs down here at the bottom and that helps it move around. We have all of its legs that have those peace signs on them. But if you look at this very top claw right there, that doesn't look like a peace sign. 
This is how you tell that this is a male horseshoe crab. A male horseshoe crab has this kind of fist with a hook. I like to say a boxing glove with a hook. I know that Captain Chris likes to say, kind of like a thumbs up, like that. So if you ever find a horseshoe crab that these top claws right are here, if it has a boxing glove with a hook, that is a male horseshoe crab. So it's a very easy way to tell. Now one last thing I want to show you here is those book gills that we were talking about before. So those book gills move all around. They're kind of fluid, just like the pages of a book. You know, they flip around and all that. The horseshoe crab's staying in one position right now, so you can't see it moving them moving too much. But those book gills are a really great way of surviving for them. Very cool. Awesome. So then I'm going to show you this horseshoe crab. So this horseshoe crab, if you take a close look, this one looks a lot more like that model that I was showing you. So a horseshoe, this horseshoe crab, you can see the feathered legs down here. You can see the claws right over here. And then at the very top, you see those peace sign pinchers for the top claw. So this means that this is a female horseshoe crab. If you have all peace signs on that horseshoe crab, it's going to be a female. As I mentioned before, females also get way bigger than male horseshoe crabs, but if it's a younger horseshoe crab, size is, isn't always the way to tell if it's a male or a female. So you want to take a look there. Letty, Reagan wants to know if the claws at the end of the legs will pinch you and they That's hurt. Really great question. So um, when I hold a horseshoe crab, I am careful to avoid the claws. I have never been pinched by a horseshoe crab, and I don't think it's because I'm overly cautious or anything. Uh, but they do try and grab onto things. You know, that's the nature of a horseshoe crab. They're trying to use their claws to feel the world around them, maybe grab anything that might be trying to threaten them. But otherwise, if you're careful with a horseshoe crab, I highly doubt you're going to be pinched by one. Yeah, I know. I put my finger right into those when I'm teaching with students, and they will just, it's like a little baby holding onto your finger it is, is all. It's like when a baby tries to grab your <laughs> finger and you're like, oh. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so one last thing I wanted to show you actually because this horseshoe crab has very distinctive eyes. If you look right up here, that is a horseshoe crab eye. Oh yeah. Up close and personal, real life. So that horseshoe crab eye, um, it's looking right now, and the way that it's seeing the world is kind of like the way an insect would see the world. Or maybe if you're looking through a kaleidoscope, it's a lot of pictures put together, and that's how the horseshoe crab would be viewing everything. And then you can even maybe see those three eyes that I was talking about right at the top. Oh yeah, we got them. Yeah, that's great. So those are uh, some of its light detecting eyes. This lets a horseshoe crab know when it's a full moon. So they're able to take in a lot of light into those eyes. And it know, um, during a full moon, that's when it's going to come up and mate on the beach because the tides are perfect for laying eggs. Uh, also, those are able to take in a lot of light so that um, it kind of magnifies it so that a horseshoe crab can find a mate if it needs to. That's great. Very cool. Very nice. So those are our live horseshoe crabs, something very exciting that I wanted to talk about today. And the last thing I want to show you is actually a craft that you can do with a horseshoe crab. Uh, linked in our video right now are cutout pages so that you can actually cut out a horseshoe crab, put it together yourself um, if you have a printer at home. But if you don't have a printer at home, we came up with a pretty simple craft for you to do. So we have this horseshoe crab right here, and all this involves is a paper plate and a piece of paper that you cut into a tail. We happen to have some googly eyes on hand, so we added some googly eyes for the horseshoe crab. But if you don't have those, no problem. Just draw some eyes on yourself. And then sometimes, if you find a horseshoe crab, you can find it with seaweed stuck to its back. You can find different shells on it, um, like slipper snails. So if you want to add decoration to the back of your horseshoe crab, go for it, because it would be totally scientifically accurate. Awesome. Uh, so that's a really easy crab for you to do at home. Uh, so that's all I have for you today. I really appreciate everyone tuning in and watching Breakfast with the Bay with us. You know, we have a lot of fun doing these. And if you've been enjoying these videos and you can, you can go to the donation link down in our comment section to help support Save the Bay. Uh, but otherwise, I hope that you've enjoyed the segment today and we'll be back tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for more at Breakfast with the Bay.